old pal Archie Gamble here, coming at you from downtown London, Ontario. Well, actually, more accurately, Old South, Portley Village area of London, Ontario. There is a distinction, and people that live here will be more than happy to tell you that. It's another episode, though, of uh, Gamble Rebel and a story from days gone by. Children gather around the fire while the old man tells tales of old. I kind of feel like that sometimes. But today's story is pretty interesting. It takes place in 1988, and it involves the super mega huge metal band Metallica and how I met them. So uh, it's a pretty fun story, and uh, you got a few minutes to waste. So now let's talk about it. So essentially how it starts off is that um, I, at the time, was in a band called Nasty Glass, which I have discussed on The Ramble before, a very important part of my musical upbringing. And uh, at the time, we were mostly a cover band, playing six nights a week, 50 weeks a year, across Canada, back and forth. It was our job, our life and our living. And we loved every minute of it. So at this point of time, I can't remember the exact time of year, as in month, but I do remember we were playing in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, at the uh, legendary Gasworks nightclub. We were doing three nights, which we tended to do. We tend to play Monday through Wednesday. And the funny thing is about those bookings is that uh, I can remember when we first started playing, I used to want, I was upset we weren't playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which is usually the prime night, nights or time frame to be playing in a club, you know, Weekends, people go out more, the bar is more packed. But it was funny, I brought it up to, I think it was Larry that was managing the gas at the time. He said, you want to try us on a weekend sometime? And he kind of chuckled and he said, you know, it's funny. It's the opposite of what you're thinking. He goes, you guys are here Monday to Wednesday because you draw. And that was, those are the nights that we need bands that draw to, to bring more people in. He goes, the weekends, it almost doesn't matter who's playing. It's the gas works. It's going to be busy. So we tended to do, tended to do, tended to do uh, front halves, as they call them, Monday through Wednesday. And it was great. It was always fun. We always drew a pretty decent crowd. So I believe this was the Monday night of the of three night stand. And we were playing away. And as these things sometimes happen, you tend to notice a commotion when something happens, a fight, or some kind of event takes place with someone, while no one walks into a club. You can kind of, the vibe changes, and you can see people kind of congregating into one area. And, and that was what was taking place on this evening. So I got off stage and one of our guys, I believe it might've been Andrew Lay, who was our monitor guy, came over and told me, he said, Archie, Lars Ulrich from Metallica is here. I said, oh, really? So it turns out that in fact he was there and he was with his uh, drum tech. And I was surprised to see, A, Lars Ulrich from Metallica at one of our shows, B, Lars Ulrich from Metallica in Toronto. They weren't playing there or anything. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty cool, you know, walking around, being Lars. It was just before the Black Album was written, recorded, released. You know, so they were, famous but not mega famous as they became but still you're in a rock bar in toronto ontario you know everyone knew who he was so there was a real buzz in the air and it's funny because i was standing between sets having a drink and a guy that was a fan of ours i say fan in quotes because at that point we were basically just a cover band so uh but he, he was someone that came to our show that appreciated us he came up to me and he was shaking. And he said, Archie, Lars Ulrich from Metallica is here. And I said, yeah, I saw him. And then this kid was wearing a Metallica t-shirt, right? So it's funny because I, I, uh, I'd gone over at one point and I believe I asked Lars if he wanted to jam. Actually, yes, that's exactly what happened. I walked over to introduce myself. And you tend to do these kind of things. I do it with, you know, someone from, from a, uh, same level band had come in. You typically ask musicians to get the play, but especially the old well-known one, right? And I remember I'd asked him, I said, you know, introduce myself. 
and he was pretty drunk, and you could, you know, it was apparently intoxicated, you could, it was apparent, right, but he was friendly, and everything was super really nice, he goes, no, man, I guess I'm just, you know, I just have a night off, just watching you guys, I'd rather not play, I've had a few drinks, he said, okay, no pressure, you know, and he explained to me that they were in Toronto for a couple of days, rehearsing, uh, because they were on the Monsters of Rock tour. If you remember that uh, tour, it's a, it's a staple of the European hard rock touring circuit. But the only time it's ever come to North America was 1988. And the lineup was, I believe, oh shit, Van Halen with Sammy Hagar headline, Scorpions, Kingdom Come, Metallica, Dokken. Not in that order. So they were playing with this Monsters of Rock show in Buffalo, New York, which is just less than two hours from Toronto, just over the border for the geographically challenged. And um, the show was coming up perhaps, I think it was that weekend. So they opted to spend their time in a more cosmopolitan city like Toronto rather than go to Buffalo and spend a few days off. And also, as I said, they were rehearsing. So yeah, I said, you know, you, know, you want to get a jam? He said, no, it's cool. I'm just out for a drink. Uh, I'm a little drunk and we've been rehearsing all day. Just watching you guys. I said, okay, that's cool. So back to the, the fan I was talking to that was wearing the Metallica t-shirt. He was shaking. He was, he was so excited. And he said, yeah, you know, Lars is here. And I said, well, I was just talking to him. You want to meet him? And he was passed out with excitement. I said, yeah, come on. He seemed like a good guy, right? So... I took the guy over, I can't remember his name. And I said, Lars, this is a friend of ours. He, he's a really big fan of your band and he would like to meet you. And he you know, went down with a shirt on and everything. And he kept shaking, he says, Lars, got a little Sharpie. He said, Lars, would you sign my shirt? And here's where things got a little odd. Lars says, you know, in a dismissive tone of voice, will I or do I want to? And I was like, I was like oh boy. And the kid was like, I don't know. He goes, give me the marker. And just kind of scribbled something on his shirt and turned his back. Now, in his defense, I have to say that, you know, a lot of people were approaching him, asking for autographs, pictures, trying to buy him a drink, conversation, and so on and so forth. I get it. You know, the guy just wanted to sit down and have a few drinks and watch a band. But, you know, if you just want to sit down and have a few drinks and not be bothered, Stay at the bar of the Four Seasons because no one there is going to care that you're Metallica. But if you come to the number one rock club in a major metropolitan city like Toronto, yeah, your fans are going to be, you know, in full attendance, right? So I see both sides of it. And here's what happened after the guy got his autograph. He was excited, a little disappointed that Lars was, Lars was a little abrupt with him. And again, a little drunk, perhaps that contributed to it. And uh, walked away. So as I'm standing there with Lars, one of our crew came over. I think it was Chunk David Haynes, who was a stage guy in general, all around kick-ass person. I'm, I'm quite certain it was him. It was unknowingly that I had already asked Lars, came over and said, hey Lars, want to get and play with the band? And Lars snapped and said, no, I don't want to jam. I, I wish everyone would leave me alone. I'm just here for a drink and to watch. Dave said, okay, sorry. And again, you know, there's two sides to that, right? You don't want to be bothered. You're a rock star, don't come to the gas works. But at the same time, I, I can see it being, from his perspective, perhaps a little too much. So, anyway, he, he was very, very pleasant and very polite with me. And uh, I had to excuse myself to go back on stage. So, as the night progressed, he got increasingly more and more intoxicated. As I'm sure we did too, but not to this level. He was, he was pretty fucked up, pardon my French. And the other, I'll never forget is that he had a, a bottle of Ocean Spray Cranberry with him. That he had his drum, uh, Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice. That his drum tech carrier around with him because his preferred drink was vodka and cranberry. And there, it wasn't a common drink at the time. Uh, like, now you go to a bar and order it. 
pretty much anywhere. But I do remember at the time it was it was considered kind of an exotic drink. So he came prepared with his own mix and he went to drum tech would go up to the bar and order a double or whatever it may be and add an ice and add his own uh, his own stock of, of cranberry juice. Kind of a, you know, um, rock star thing to do, I guess, in a, you know, in, in, a, in a weird way. And power to him, right? So I came off stage for the next set. We used to do three 45 minute sets back then. And I think it might have been Dave Haynes again, who told me he was laughing. I came off the side stairs. If you came down to the stage of the Gasparks was, was um, run lengthwise. The bar was long and narrow. That's what she said. So you played facing the, you know, the wall and that's where the soundboard was. But when you came off stage, the men's bathroom was just 15, 20 feet away from the stairs coming off stage. And Dave met me at the stairs, he was laughing. <coughs> he said, Archie, Lars just puked all over the, the bathroom. Like, I mean, all over the bathroom. He aimed for the sink and missed. And I went in there, I had him going to the bathroom anyway. And sure enough, there was vomit everywhere. It was a vomitorium in there. And I laughed and I said to Dave, I said, you know, I should bottle this and sell metallic chunks. As a, 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 a money maker, get a little laugh about that. So, um, yeah, I did, yeah, you know, he stayed, kept drinking and after he puked, right? So I got talking to some friends about the experience. And then I, we would sometimes stick around and have a few drinks with the staff, more often than not. And everyone was kind of blown away, you know, because Lars Ulrich was a huge rock star in 1988. And uh, we're all after sharing our stories. And uh, there was a band in Toronto, Guns N' Roses tribute band called Runs In Your Hoses. And the singer, uh, Rusty, great guy, uh, God bless me, you know, rest in peace, he passed a few years ago. He was a, a doppelganger for for Axl Rose, the red hair and everything, right? So apparently, he he was chuckling, telling a story about his experience that night with Lars. Now, if you remember the gas works, for those of you that don't know, there was a, a second story bar upstairs. It wasn't quite as popular. And I believe on this, I think it was a Monday night, it was closed. So they, a couple of people had taken Lars upstairs. Uh, I will. I'm guessing here, I don't want to be slanderous, for the uh, purpose of indulging in recreational narcotics, Let's put it that way, they wanted some privacy. So while they were up there, Rusty went behind the bar and got a shot of Jack Daniels and handed it to Lars and said, welcome to Toronto, Lars, no friendly gesture. And Lars slips and goes, what is that, Jack Daniels? Gives it back to us. Only Axl Rose drinks that shit. Like, insert a knife twist. Which, you know, kind of a dickish thing to do, but hey, whatever. Which, uh... So yeah, anyway, they came back downstairs. I digress, as they tend to do. Uh, and, you know, the story as I told you. So it was funny, the next night, I was talking to one of the our staff, who shall remain nameless, a friend of mine, and she told me that Lars had approached her near the end of the night, said, uh, <laughs> would I be able to come back to your place? Uh, I might need a place to crash today. But she kind of rolled her eyes. And, uh, you know, this guy's staying in a corner suite of the Four Seasons, a multi-millionaire rock star. Uh, and that's his pickup line, right? And by the way, it was successful. It worked, <laughs> but again, not my business. So, yeah, so, you know, with the, all in all, it was, a, it was kind of an eventful evening, you know, um, a young band, I was looking for some kind of, uh, you know, confirmation and, uh, you know, Lars was pretty complimentary. I mean, we were doing standard hard, hard rock covers, but we also covered uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls by Metallica, and we did all Metallica's cover of, uh, the Misfits song, uh, Last Caress. So, you know, we, we, we tried to be more well balanced. And we were definitely a, a band of the times, you know, but we did tend to lean more towards the bluesy 
Aerosmith hard rock kind of stuff rather than just Poison and Bon Jovi, although we did do those covers as well. But Lars was kind. I remember he was complimentary about the band. Sounds good. You know, whether he meant it or not, who knows. But here's where the story gets better. And I apologize, by the way, for the touching of the face. Uh, Canada, springtime here, the Mother Nature is battling it out with herself. It's uh, 17 degrees one day and then cold and dry the next day. So my skin is very dry and itchy from the weather changes. But I digress. So, as I said, it was a three-night stand. And... Uh, I can't remember, to be honest with you, if it was the next night, the Tuesday, or the Wednesday, the last night of the stint. And well, we're playing again, and uh, we're on stage. Now, if you walked in the guest room, like I said, it was a long, narrow room. To the right would be the bar. The bar was on a raised uh, level that was equal to the stage, and you'd say, or the seating area was below both. So if you're on stage playing, you look to your left, you were level with, I level with the bar, which was convenient for ordering drinks. Uh, so anyway, I looked over and I saw Sebastian Bach at Skid Row. He's hard to miss, he's six fucking five or something, right? And at the time, on the cover of Rolling Stone, you know, they were huge. Not to mention that prior to Skid Row's success, Sebastian was already a celebrity in Toronto with his other bands, you know, VO5. And he was very outgoing, exuberant person, so it's hard to miss, right? There he was, tall as life. Now, we happened to be playing a cover song at the time by a band called Tesla, a song called Love Song. Now, if you're familiar with that song, for the first half of the song, there's no drums. So I used it as an opportunity to go over, and once again, as we do, ask, uh, Sebastian Bach, if he wanted to sit in and sing. And I thought to myself, this is pretty cool. Two rock stars have shown up at our gig in as many days. So I dash off the stage and I run over up to the bar. And I'm completely flabbergasted to find that not only is Sebastian standing there, but sitting around him on bar stools are the four members of Metallica, the entire band. That caught me short. I was like, well, hey, you know, what are you guys doing here kind of thing, right? And uh, I have to say, Sebastian was really positive and, and, and uh, encouraging. He said, hey, you guys, shook my hand, you know, the, the, the rock handshake. You guys sound great, man, you know, keep it up. And I can recall, we played some Kiss, you know, we played a lot of stuff. He, we, same age group, we grew up listening to Aerosmith and some Aerosmith covers of Kiss. And I remember him headbanging when we played Deuce by Kiss. So I said, hey, man, do you guys want to jam? And... I remember Kirk Hammett, the guitar player in Metallica. He's kind of got a, he's, he's, he's very, um, kind of like a kid-like you know, vibe to him. Very, very nice guy. Kind of high voice going, hey guys, yeah, let's go up there and jam, guys. You know, James, you can play drums and we'll switch instruments. And uh, I forget which one of them responded. He said, no, man, you know, we just came from, it might've been James Hatfield. Said, we just came from rehearsal. So we've been drinking, we've been playing all day. You know, we're just watching you guys. I said, you sure? He said, the audience would love it, you know? He said, no, we're cool, man, but thank you. And Sebastian was like, you guys rock. And it was nice, right? It was a nice little moment. A little disappointed that they didn't want to jam. That's how it goes, right? And <laughs> went back on stage, finished Love Song. And I came back over after, between sets and I was talking to this, my funny James Hatfield moment, you know? And, but anyway, those James Hatfield, he's very direct no bullshit kind of person, which I appreciate and respect. But back then, part of my shtick was to play the drums standing up. And he said, yeah, he goes, you know, that headfield voice, hey man, you ever sit down? And I went, no man, I got really bad hemorrhoids. And it just came off the top of my head. And he laughed. And I, forget, and I got a <clears throat> right on. I got a headfield right on, that was pretty cool. So anyway, it was, uh, it was a pretty unique experience. I mean, you know, they did not get up and jam, uh, but they stayed and they were clapping along and stuff. And the irony of this is, is that I didn't know until years later, the legendary rock photographer, Ross Halfin, 
was actually with them. He had been at the rehearsal with Sebastian, and they were jamming on metal covers, and Sebastian in the band, not Ross. And um, years later, Ross and I became friendly. I don't know if we call us friends, but we're acquaintances. And he's been very, very uh, generous and friendly with me about concert tickets and passes and stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, side story to this story, I got to see Metallica in um, in Toronto at what Rogers Center, which is Sky Dome to me, I always will be, uh, a few years back. And I was chatting with Ross on Facebook one day and he told me he was coming to Toronto and he asked me for any good, recommended good record stores because he's got a massive and, and amazing vinyl collection. So I asked some friends and got some names for him and stuff and uh, and he just said no, I, without even asking or prompting him or hinting or anything, he said, you know, would you like to come to the Metallica show? And I'll put you on the guest list. I said, sure. And then my, you know, my nephew Stephen, who I love, love you Stephen, is a huge metal fan. And uh, I thought, yeah, it'd be great to take him. So he was as good as his word the day of the show. Uh, Stephen drove in from Hamilton and I took the train from London and we met at the box office. So I got there first and uh, go to the will call to pick up the tickets. And there's backstage passes and snake pit tickets passes, which if you know um, Metallica, they, they have a, an area in the center of the stage when they're in the round or in the front of the stage when they play regular style, that only fan club members and, and uh, other people can access. It's literally part of the stage. So the stage goes around you and you're escorted in before the show and escorted out after. Uh, these are incredible seats. And uh, I was really knocked out. And someone told me that those seats sell. I don't know if they sell them, but they boot back, I think, like on uh, Scalp. You can could, you could scalp those seats for $3,000 or more. So it was a very generous and nice gesture of, of, uh, of Ross to do. Hey, anyway, I'm the like hugest Metallica fan, but I knew my nephew would be blown away. So I, I called my nephew, Stephen, and I said, listen, I'm still outside the Sky Dome. I said, I got the tickets, but the terrible seats are way up in the nosebleeds. And being the great guy that he is, he Stephen, Stephen said, Uncle Glenn, I don't care. I'm just happy to be going. You know, thanks for thinking of me. So he showed up and we met, had a hug. I said, sorry about the seats, man. And it's like the Wayne's World seat. I pulled out the backstage passes, schwing. And he was ecstatic to say the least. And uh, before the show, we went backstage and uh, they had a lounge bar set up, open bar free. And then, you know, one of the world managers comes in and says, you know, you're guests of the band, you're welcome to drink. The bartender's working for free, so we asked it. He took the bartender, so you know, I put 20 bucks in the jug, and we had a few drinks before the show. And, you know, there were a lot of cool people back there, actually. I met the guys from Anvil and chatted with them, and uh, Robin Lips from Anvil, the founders, and um, uh, Sam, Sam uh, oh, what is his name? That's Sam Elliott, the filmmaker from Montreal. Sam Dunn, who does, uh, uh, who does the Headbanger, has Headbangers, uh, Headbangers films? Forgive me, but you know what I'm talking about if you're a metal fan. He does the best documentaries on metal and bands like Iron Maiden. He did the documentary Global Metal, Flight 666, Iron Maiden. Um, yes, a really good guy. I got to talk to him for a while. Mitch LaFon was also there. And, uh, you know, Mitch, a great metal journalist, rock and roll journalist, music journalist. Real nice guy. So it was an all-around great experience, you know. And actually, funny enough, I felt like such an old man because you know, I do like Metallica, but I'm not a huge fan. But no seating. After a while, my old man back started to act up, act up on me. So um, I said to Stephen, I said, would you mind if I just went and sat down? He said, no, Uncle Glenn, go ahead. So I left the snake pit. And I um, probably shouldn't say this, but there was some kid, I'm a really rabid fan outside of the snake pit. He by himself. And I said, are you alone? And he goes, yeah. I said, I'll I, I stuck the snake pit pass on him. I said, if you cause any trouble and get me in shit, I'll find you. Go enjoy it. And the kid was practically in tears. He was so happy. So I'm glad that I did that. 
technically you're really not supposed to do such a thing because you are there as uh, a guest of whomever has invited you and ultimately a guest of Metallica and your behavior reflects on the person that invited you. Your past has their initials on it. So I said, you know, R.A.H. Ross Halfen, right? If this kid had have caused any problems, it would have come back on me because they're numbered and all that shit, right? Um, but I'm a pretty good judge of character and I could tell that this kid was just a super fan and a teenager, if I'm not mistaken. He wanted any, you know, he was, he had a souvenir to keep the past, you know, I've been hundreds of these shows and backstage and then, well, I'm grateful for it. You know, I'm glad that someone who was really grateful for it got it. And I went outside to get some air and give my ears a rest, being an old man. And I'm sitting on the bench out front of the Rogers place and Derek Wibley, the singer for 741, goes walking by. And we've met before and some 41 had covered a Helix song on the FUBAR soundtrack. That's a whole other story for another day and another vlog. I said, hey, Derek. You heard me. Clearly heard me with the girl. Head down, hoodie drawn up, walking real fast. I said, Derek. She looked at me and he kept walking. I said, I just kind of chuckled. I said, oh, okay, that's the second time you've been rude to me, which we will discuss in another vlog. And um, anyway, I just remember thinking, well, I met the guys from Metallica prior to this and couldn't have been nicer. It's this guy. Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. There's my story. And I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I've enjoyed telling you. And once again, have a lovely, lovely day. And uh, fight fire with fire.